Hello once again and welcome to this Island at Millie's Nether Cut series. I'm Silence and I'll be taking you through the first course of CCNA Introduction to Networks. So this is the second module, basic switch and any device configuration. And as usual, if you have any questions, leave a comment and I'll make sure I respond as soon as I can. In the first module, we introduced what a network is and the components that makes up a network from the end devices, the network devices, and the media. The end devices and the network devices, when they are patches, they generally come with some configurations, but for particular networks, they will require specific information and instruction. And that is our module objective to implement the initial settings, that is that specific information in those instructions. This will include the passwords, the IP addressing, and the default gateway. We have a table there that summarizes what we're going to be doing in this module. One, explaining how to access the Cisco operating system device for configuration purposes. Two, explaining how to navigate the Cisco operating system to configure the networks. We we'll then look at the command structure describing the command structure of the Cisco operating system software. Then we'll look at the basic device configuration. After making the basic device configurations, we we'll learn how to conf how to save those configurations. We we'll then look at ports and addresses, explaining how devices communicate across network media. Then we will configure some IP addresses on host devices. We will then conclude with verifying connectivity between two end devices. So all end devices and network devices require what we call an operating system. And basically by definition, this is a software program that manages computer hardware and software resources. It is uh, responsible for controlling the allocation of hardware resources to different applications and processes that will be running on your computer. So what happens is we have the user interface from the illustration. We have the user interface which allows the user to request specific tasks from the computer. So if you want to open a program, you open a program through the user interface. And the, the user interface, it can be either through the GUI which is the graphical user interface or the CLI, which is the command line interface. So from the user, we have the portion of the operating system which interfaces with the applications and the user, and it is called the shell. The shell then interacts with the kernel, which is the portion of the operating system that interacts directly with the computer hardware. Then we have the hardware which is the physical part of the computer. And that basically summarizes what an operating system is and how it works. The graphical user interface and the command line interface, GUI and CLI, are two types of interfaces that are used to interact with the computer system. The GUI provides a more visual interface with windows, menus, icons, whilst the CLI provides a text-based interface that requires the user to type commands into a terminal. So from the diagrams there, the one above, you can see there is the start menu, there are icons, there is a bin, there is a desktop there. That represents what we call the graphical user interface. The one below, it has a command, a text-based command, IP config or which is typed into the terminal and when executed gives us the information. Uh, we have the media state, connection, connection specific, DNS suffix, two different types of user interfaces. One which uses menus, icons, the other one which uses text being input on a terminal. Now, the GUI is a more user-friendly interface and requires less understanding of what actually happens in the command structure that con controls the system. On the other hand, the CLI requires the user to have that knowledge of the underlying command structure. 
The GUI can fail, can crash, or cannot operate as specified. That is why, for these reasons, the network devices that we use are typically assessed, accessed through the command line interface. And generally, the, the GUI is preferred by novice users, while the CLI is preferred by advanced users and system administrators. Because the CLI is useful when you want to control what the system does. I think the GUI is a bit limited. It doesn't offer that much control to the system or that much control over the system. Now, on the purpose of an operating system, we have the PC operating system, which enables the user to use the mouse, make selections, run programs, use the keyboard to enter text, text-based commands, and view the output on a monitor. Almost the same thing with CLI-based network operating systems, but the, div the difference, the key difference being, since CLI, the command line interface is a text-based interface. You can only enter text to run programs. So you have the keyboard being used to run the network programs, the keyboard being used to enter text and text-based commands, and the monitor being used to view the, the output. Suppose you've purchased your networking device, you've purchased your switch. Now, how do you get access to that switch so that you can make some basic configurations? We have access methods which refers to the ways that the user can access the network device for management and configuration purposes. Two main ways of doing that, we have the physical access and the remote access. With the physical access, we have the console, which is a management port that connects directly to the device using a serial cable and a terminal emulator program. So from the diagram, we can see there is the cable. Then we have PATI, which is the terminal emulator program that is being used in that case. For remote access, we have two types, Telnet and Secure Shell. Both establish remote access to the device using a network connection. But there is a key difference between the two. Telnet is insecure and SSH is secure. Why insecure? Is because Telnet sends user authentication, it sends passwords, and all the commands, they are sent in plain text. On the other hand, secure shell, all this is in encrypted, therefore it is secure. With that said, SSH is the recommended method for remotely connecting to a device because it is secure. Terminal emulation programs, these are the programs that are used to connect to a networking device. Several programs that we'll be using in the course, we have Party, TerraTem, and Secure CRT to choose from. As a security feature, the Cisco operating system software separates management access into two primary command modes, the user exec and the privileged exec mode. The user exec is the default mode used for the operating system's command line interface and allows access to only a limited number of basic monitoring commands. For example, it allows ping commands or the telnet command. From the diagram we can see it is identified by the CLI prompt that ends with an arrow sort of symbol. Privileged exec mode on the other hand allows access to all commands and features and in this mode the user can view and change, change a device's configuration. From the diagram as well we can see it is identified by the CLI prompt that ends with an hash symbol. Now, to configure a device, the user must enter the global configuration mode. The global configuration mode has access to configuration options on a device. And it's important to take note that 
any configuration changes that are made in this mode can affect the operation of a device as a whole. Now from the diagram we can see how do we identify the global configuration mode. There is the config prompt that is there just before the device name switch. Config identifies that you are in the global configuration mode. From the global configuration mode we go to the two sub configuration modes, the line and the interface configuration mode. The line being used to configure the console, SSH, telnet and auxiliary access and the interface being used to configure the switch port or the router interface. We have introduced different modes that we have from the user exec, the privileged exec mode, the global configuration mode and the two sub configuration modes, the line and the interface configuration mode. Now I will explain the navigation between the modes using an example. If you want to configure an IP address on an interface, you do that in the interface configuration mode. But how do you get there from the user exec mode? Because if you access your device, you are welcomed in the user exec mode. But how do you move from there to where you want to make changes to your device? So from the user exec to the privilege, we have the enable command being used. Then to move from the privileged exec mode to the global configuration mode, you have the configure terminal command being used there. From the global configuration mode, you can now go to the interface configuration mode using the interface command in our example. As we can see, the last illustration that we have there, we have the interface fast ethernet 0 slash 1. The interface being the command, the fast ethernet being the type of interface you are going to access. Then from there, you can go on and change your IP address or input your IP address. So basically this summarizes how we navigate between different modes. Enable command, configure terminal, line and interface. Now if you want to exit, if you want to exit a given mode, you can just use the exit command. It is necessary for the network admin to understand the command structure so as to be able to use the command line interface for device configuration. Now the Cisco operating system it has quite a number of commands with each having a specific format and only executable in the appropriate mode. So for example if you want to configure an interface IP address you cannot do that in the line configuration mode. You can only execute that command in the interface configuration mode. In the figure below, we have the general format for a command. So we have the prompt which shows you in which mode you are in. We have the command and we have the keyword or argument. The keyword is a specific parameter defined in the operating system. Whilst the argument is not predefined, it is a variable defined by the user. Now, to demonstrate the difference between the two keyword and argument, we have show IP protocols. So you will see IP protocols is the keyword. It is defined in the operating system. It is not variable. Then with the argument, we have ping, then we have an IP address there, 192.168.10.5. That IP address is a variable. It is defined by the user. So this summarizes the difference between the keyword and the argument and the command structure given in that figure. Suppose you want to make a configuration, but you don't know what command to use to make that configuration or you don't know in which mode to make that configuration. We have two forms of help that is available, context sensitive help and command syntax check. With context sensitive help, it enables you to quickly find answers to which commands are available in each command mode 
which commands start with specific characters, which arguments or keywords are available to the particular commands. Now, to access this, you simply have to enter a question mark. So from the example illustrated below, we have show question mark, meaning we want to find which keywords follow after the show command. So if you don't know what are the keywords that follow the show command, we have triple A access list, ARP, showing the triple A values, the access list, and the ARP table respectively. So that is an example of how you can use the context sensitive help. With command syntax check, it verifies that a valid command was entered by the user. So if the interpreter cannot understand the command being entered, it will provide feedback describing what is wrong with that command. So in the, in the example that you can see, the user is in the privileged exec mode and is trying to input the interface command. But you cannot input the interface command in the privileged exec mode. You can only input the interface command in the global configuration mode. So that's where the error is there. So you can see the feedback invalid input detected at a specific position. The command line interface provides hotkeys and shortcuts that make configuring, monitoring, and troubleshooting easier. Now, you have commands and keywords that can be shortened to the minimum number of characters that identify a unique selection. Now, an example, if we, want, if we have the, con the configure terminal command and we want to shorten that, we can either shorten the configure part to con t, as in the example. But the problem with con, it is not executable. Why? Because it is not unique. If you use con for configure, you can as well use it for connect. Now, following that, we have conf t, c-o-n-f-t. That is executable. Why? Because it is a unique shortened command. And that is basically how you can shorten some of the commands to make your configuring and troubleshooting more efficient. In the table there, we have commands that can be used to exit an operation. So instead of using exit command, you can just press Control C, Control Z, or Control Shift plus six. Now Control C and Control Z, this ends the configuration mode and returns to the privileged exec mode. Control C can also be used when you are in the setup mode and you are brought back to the and you want to abort back to the command prompt. The last one, it is an all-purpose break sequence used to abort DNS lookups, trace routes, and pings. Now, moving on to basic device configuration, we have the first configuration command on any device being to give it a unique host name. Now, by default, all devices are assigned a fixed default name. This is a problem, though. Why? Because, for example, if all switches are left with their default names, it will be very difficult to identify a specific device. All of the devices will be named as switches. Now, the host name provides confirmation that you are connected to the correct device. There are a couple of guidelines that can be used in naming devices. You have to start with a letter, it should contain no spaces, end with a letter, use only letters, digits, and dashes, and should be less than 64 characters in length. Now, the command used for configuring a device hostname is the command hostname, followed by the name of the device. So, in the example there, we can see the hostname command should be in the global configuration global configuration mode and we have host name with the name of the device being SW short for switch SW dash floor dash one now if you want to go back to the default name of the switch you can always use the no host name global configuration command 
we introduced and discussed the importance of network security. And in that regard, all networking devices should limit administrative access. Because with access, someone can change configurations on a device and that could be catastrophic for the network. So there is need to secure the user exec, the privileged exec, and the remote telnet access with passwords. Those passwords need to be encrypted as well, and you should provide legal notifications. Now, the use of weak passwords is a security concern. That's why we have password guidelines to guide us when we are coming up with passwords. You need to use passwords that are more than eight characters, that have a combination of upper, lowercase letters, numbers, and special characters. You should avoid using the same passwords for all devices and you should not use common ways as they can easily be guessed. So for example, you cannot use your name as a password. You can, but that will be a very weak password. You cannot use your date of birth. Someone can get that information and that could be a weak password as well. Now, there is need to know that in most of the labs that we'll be doing over this course, they'll be using simple passwords such as Cisco class, passwords that you can easily remember. However, these passwords are weak and should not be used in a production environment. We now look at configurations that need to be made to secure access on a device, starting with securing the user exec mode access. You first enter the line console configuration mode using the line console command. Then you specify the user exec mode using the password command followed by the password that you want to use. You then enable the user exec access using the login command. Now securing the privileged exec mode access, you use the enable secret command in the global configuration mode followed by the password that you want to use. Securing the virtual lines, you first enter the line V2I configuration mode using the line V2I 015 command. Uh, why 015? Because most Cisco devices, they have 16 virtual lines. So we have line 0, line 1, up to line 15. That's why we have line V2I 015. You will be accessing all the virtual lines. So after accessing the virtual line configuration mode, you then specify the password using the password command followed by the password and enable access using the login command. So we can see we have three different examples there being shown. Take note of the mode in which to make your command. It's very important. You will see that the password for the first one should be in the config line mode, line configuration mode. The second one, the enable secret should be in the global configuration mode. In the last one, it should be in the line configuration mode as well. The only difference between the first one and the last one, we have the console line and the visual lines for the last one. Suppose you've made a number of configurations on a device and you want to verify if the configurations have been made. We have the show running config or the show startup config commands being used to make those verifications. The problem with the startup config and the running config files is they display most passwords in plain text. So we can see from the first illustration there, we have a running config file displaying the password Cisco in plain text. That is a problem because if, if someone gets access to the device, they can clearly see what are the passwords that are being used on that device. So that is the reason why we need to encrypt all plain text passwords and this is done using the service password encryption global configuration command. After making our uh, after encrypting our passwords, we can then verify. So in the third diagram there, we can verify if the passwords on the device are encrypted. So we can see the password now is a bunch of numbers, 0822. Instead of having Cisco being in plain text, it has been encrypted 
now is just a bunch of numbers. This shows the importance of password encryption on a device. A banner message is used to warn unauthorized personnel from attempting to access the device. These are legal notifications and can be important part of the legal process in the event that someone is prosecuted for breaking into a device. So a perfect example of the banner message is the sign in a gated home in a garden, beware of the dogs. You saw that you know Kutupane Imbo before entering. Now to create a banner, we use the banner MOTD global configuration command followed by the message of the day. You can clearly see there are hash symbols there. Those are called the delimiting characters and they are entered before and after the message. Also take note that the character can be any character as long as it does not okay in the message. Now to demonstrate on the other on the other side we have the demonstration of the banner MOTD, the first diagram showing the configuration, then the second the banner being displayed when attempting to access the device. So when you attempt to access the device, the welcome message will be the banner authorized access only in this example. So after making a couple of configurations from your host name, the passwords add to that configuring the interfaces with IP addresses, you need to save those configurations. And there are two system files that store the device configuration. We have the startup config and the running config. In the table, it summarizes those two system files. The startup config is stored in the NVRAM, which is the non-volatile RAM. The running config stored in the random access memory, that is the RAM. The startup config contains all the commands used by the device upon startup, and it does not lose its content when the device is powered off. On the other end, the running config reflects the current running configurations and when the device is powered off or restarted, it loses all its content. To view the startup configuration file, we use the show startup config command and for the running config, we use the show running config. So basically what happens when you are making your configurations, let's start with when you start your device you have the starting configurations starting up the device then when you start making configurations those will be the running configurations you will need to save those running configurations to the startup configurations why so that when the device is restarted the configurations will be saved on the device now to do that to save changes made to the running configuration we use the copy running copy running config startup config privilege exec mode command. Sometimes the changes made to the running configuration do not have the desired effect and there will be need to restore the device to its previous configuration. Now an example is if you've configured a host name. We've already mentioned there is the no host name command which restores the default device name. Another example, if you've assigned and configured the wrong IP address to an interface, there will be need, there will be need to change that and reverse that and input the correct IP address. Now, there are two scenarios of restoring the device to its previous configurations. One, scenario one, if the running configurations have not been saved to the startup, and two, if the running configurations have been saved. Now, dealing with scenario one, you need to remove the changed commands individually. An example, I just gave your host name. You can just use the no host name and it results. That is changing the commands individually. You can as well change the IP address by using the no IP address command or directly changing uh, in inputting the new configurations, the new IP address. I think that's the thing we will learn later on. So there are ways of changing the commands individually. Another way 
of restoring the previous configurations you can use the reload command in the privileged exec mode now it's important to take note if you use this command the device will briefly go offline leading to the network to leading to a network downtime now to scenario 2 if the desired changes were saved there will be need to clear all the configurations using the erase startup config command in the privileged exec mode after erasing you reload the device to clear the running configuration file from the RAM. Configuration files can also be saved and archived to a text document. The text file created being used as a record of how the device is currently implemented. Now the text file can also be applied as commands in the command line interface and become the running configuration on the device. This is a convenient way of manually configuring a device now the file could require editing before being used to restore a saved configuration to a device now a way the perfect example of how this is useful suppose you have multiple switches in a network the question is do you need to manually configure all the switches in the network sometimes it's no you can manually configure one switch save the running configurations copy paste the text file into the terminal window of another switch then voila the commands are loaded in the command line interface so this is a very useful way of configuring multiple devices in a network now take note that you might need to edit some few things for example 20 switches we already mentioned the need of having unique host names so you might need to change the edit the host name you might need to change as well IP addresses, the SVI configurations, quite a number of things you might need to change, but it saves you time to copy and paste text files into multiple switches. If you want your end devices to communicate with each other, you must ensure that each of them is an appropriate IP address. The use of IP addresses is the primary means of enabling devices to locate one another and establish end-to-end -end communication over the internet. Now for the structure, an IPv4 address is represented by four decimal numbers between 0 and 255. So from the diagram there we can see the IP address is 192.168.1.10. Now there's also the subnet mask which is a value that differentiates the network portion of the address from the host portion. So in this case we have 255.255.255.0. So we are going to deal with IP addresses later on but from that example we can see that the part which is 255.255.255 that is the network part and the part which is a zero that becomes the host part. I think that's a lesson for later on. We also have the default gateway, which is the IP address of the router that the host will use to access remote networks. So in this case, in our example, we have the default gateway 192.168.1.1. So IP in this course refers to both the version 4 and the version 6 IP protocols. In the previous slide, we mostly talked of the version 4 IP. The version 6 IP is the most recent version and it is replacing the IP version 4. Its structure it has 128 bits in length and it is written as a string of hexadecimal values. It is also not case sensitive and can be written in either lowercase or uppercase. So from the diagram there we can see an example of an IPv6 address. A string of hexadecimal values starting with 2001. We also have the prefix which might act as a subnet mask uh, if you are to compare it with the version 4. Then we have the default gateway starting with FE80 which is also called the link local address. I think some of the lessons concerning these IP addresses can be reserved for later in the course. Concerning interfaces and ports. 
we have network communications depending on the interfaces and the cables that connect them each physical interface having standards that define it and a cable connecting to the interface designed to match the physical standards of the interface with that respect we have different types of media with different characteristics and different benefits now each link on the internet will require a specific network media type we have examples they give in copper fiber and wireless layer 2 switches they have physical ports which are used for connecting device we have a switch being illustrated there and i think you can see the ports those little holes there these ports however do not support ip addressing but an ip address is assigned to the switch visual interface which is then used to remotely access the switch for management purposes So, we've already established that end devices on a network need an IP address in order to communicate with other devices on the network. Now, how do you make those configurations on the end devices specifically? The IPv4 address information is entered manually or automatically using what we call the DHCP dynamic host protocol. Now to configure on a Windows PC, you open the control panel, network sharing center, change adapter settings, select an adapter, then right click on that adapter to select the properties. From there it will display the local area connection properties. Then you highlight the internet protocol version 4, click properties and open the internet protocol version 4 properties window. From that window, that is where you can manually configure your IPv4 address, the subnet mask, and the default gateway. Or you can obtain the IP address and the DNS server address automatically using DHCP. We conclude this basic switch and end device configuration module with the switch visual interface configuration. Now, we've already mentioned that a switch does not require an IP address to perform its basic operation. However, if we are to access the switch remotely, specifically for management purposes, an IP address is to be configured on the switch visual interface. Now, to configure an SVI, you first enter the interface VLAN 1 command in the global configuration mode Next, assign the IP address using the IP address command followed by the IP address in the subnet mask. So in this example is illustrated our IP address is 192.168.1.20 with the mask being 255.255.255.0. Finally, you enable the virtual interface using the no shutdown command. It's important to note that since we want to access the switch remotely, an IP default gateway needs to be assigned to the switch.